Hello and welcome to Trash Arts Ticks Season 3 Episode 2 with myself Ryan, we got Sam, we got Jackson. Alright. And um, this week guys, Sam's going to bring us up to speed with everything industry and then uh, me and Sam actually had the pleasure of interviewing Jessica Hunt. Um, who's a creative filmmaker and uh, she's been on the podcast before as well and then we're actually going to be talking everything Darren Aronofsky which I probably have butchered but anyway over to you Sam with industry unfortunately it's a collection of bad news because you know it's that's what the world is now we uh, love bad news <laughs> <laughs> loads of movies have left their release date schedules Last Night in Soho was going to come out in April, which is Edgar Wright's new film. That's now out in October 2021. No Time to Die is now moved to October. October. Uh, Ghostbusters has moved to November. The Uncharted movie has moved to February 2022. Mo Mobius, that Marvel vampire pointless thing with Jared Leto, that's been moved to November 2022. Black Widow has been moved again. And you're just kind of going, maybe more people should do the Warner Brothers route. Because that's going to be a whole stockload of films next year. And I mean, the audience has the anticipation for it, but there's going to be that fatigue of hearing the same things being announced over and over again. And obviously at the moment, the audience is kind of suffering that sense of fatigue already. So I, I don't know, like... I kind of feel like there's... Release it on VOD, that's what I think. There's nothing really coming out. You've got your Netflix stuff, which, you know, we've become very used to. Um, but whenever it comes to blockbusters and cinema... It kind of feels like a dying art, no? It is a dying art. And, and the thing is, like, when Warner Brothers decided to do their release in cinemas and on, you know, like Netflix does, uh, everyone freaked out and stuff. But at least those films are actually going to be released. Yeah. You know, there's just a massive back catalogue. And the fact that they haven't bothered to release Black Widow on Disney Plus is really stupid. I think that probably a lot of that is down to the backlash of Mulan. Yeah, but at the same time, they, they're going to get stocked up on their Marvel films. They're going to be like, oh crap, we've got too many kind of in some sort of sense of production. You know, it's just messy. It'll turn into wrestling, where they're just having like main events every week. Or it turns into <laughs> the trash art schedule, where it's always productions <laughs> at different stages. <laughs> um, to follow this with more bad news. Uh, bad Khan, news, Bell. Yeah. Khan Film Festival is looking to delay to potentially July slash August. Now, Khan's not going to do like the other festivals and go, right, screw it, we're going to have to do it online, where it should do it, because obviously it, it's too snobby to do that. Whereas Sundance, which is occurring at the end of this month into February, will be online. There'll be events in venue, but a lot of online screenings that people can actually get tickets for. So again, with the films being rescheduled and the festivals already looking to reschedule, you're going to see a lot more online activity again. I think that's kind of interesting for the for the festival platform anyway, though, because it, it opens it up to so many more people that wouldn't necessarily be able to travel or, or leave home for whatever reason, you know. Um, uh, and so, yeah, I think it's kind of interesting. It, it hopefully will will broaden it out more. Well, once again, it's that thing of we're independent filmmakers and we've been having to do that already with online festivals and not being able to get to certain places. So it's the, the industry having to be like, Come if you think it's going down, come down to our level. Mm. Be like everybody else, and then maybe some good news depending on how much you like Willy Wonka. Um, <clears throat> there's been talk for years of a prequel to Willy Wonka uh, called Wonka instead of uh, Wanker, which, <laughs> really, which really sounds real close, say. right? <laughs> but really um, creative name that one. I was going to say uh, <laughs> it's got the director of um, Paddington One and Two attached, who's a pretty good director, nice. so it's all right. A couple of years ago, they were looking to get Ryan Gosling involved. So you're going to say me? <laughs> <laughs> um, when did you sign up for this, Ryan? <laughs> oh, well, uh, I'm not going to talk about it. <laughs> this short list of um, Ryan Gosling also had uh, Donald um, Glover in, which was a bit of a, okay, they're going for a bit of a diverse choice. The new list of actors they're looking for, personally, is like, oh, so the, the young guys who are around right now, basically. They're obviously aging it down. It's between Timothy Chamele, or however the fuck you pronounce his last name, that's the guy from uh, Call, Call Me By Your Name and The New Dune. And the most boring actor, and you're going to hate me saying that, but Tom Holland. He's also up for the role. And he's just boring. He's just so boring choices for the Wonka character. But we'll see. I don't <laughs> know what angle they're going. 
maybe it'll work. It's just boring. How? How is Tom Holland boring? <clears throat> because he's very. I don't know. He's very. It's just there's nothing effectively exciting about him. Yeah, but you don't like the Marvel films. So you... Yeah, but I also see him in other films, and I don't like. He's okay, but he feels like he's acting as opposed to filling in. Um, An actor acting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it doesn't. He's just very old school Hollywood. Just there's, there's nothing particularly exciting. It's, it's, to be it's, honest, it's I'm, not, person, I'm not sure who he is, but that's that's because I forget names like <laughs> like no one's business. Oh right, Spider-Man. yeah, yeah. No, I I agree with you, Sam. So kind of boring. No, uh, the, the, um, what, what's that recent Netflix film? The well, Devil. Yeah, the Devil all the time. Which he was, I thought he was good in that. But everyone was kind of good in that. Rob Patterson was the best thing in that. Yeah, but you, you know? can't discredit an actor. I can. <laughs> that's, how we, that's why we talk about these things. But nonetheless, he's up for the shortlist for Wonka. We'll agree to disagree. And he's going to be shortlisted for every single young male film, along with Timothy Chalamet and Spirit Light. There are no other choices right now. Because that's what it kind of feels like, their desperation to hold on to the star system with these people who... They're not stars. I'm not young enough anymore, so... Yeah. Or else I'd be, you know, <laughs> yeah. right up there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank yeah. you, Sam, for industry. Um, so this week, I kind of invaded the interview with Sam. Um, invited. So, invited. I invaded. Um, <laughs> I was invited. Um, but basically, uh, Jessica Hunt, who's a, a very good friend of ours, she's worked with us uh, in a collaborative sense on a lot of different projects. The Truth Will Out being one, and Lonely Hearts, which we actually discuss. Um, but she's recently moved away out of the country. So we thought it was a good time to sort of um, get speaking to her, do a little interview and see what she's up to and what kind of the future holds for Jess. Uh, so yeah, hope you guys enjoy and over to us. I'm here on Trash Arts Take with Ryan. Hello. Um, hello. Well, I mean, we've already done the hello in the intro. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> we're, we're here with Jessica Hunt, who's a very hello. good friend of ours. Hello. How are you doing? You good? Yes, good. I'm very good. It's really awesome we got this chance because uh, we always wanted to get you more on the podcast in the past, but obviously with lockdown and everything else, it's kind of clashed. So it's nice to give you an opportunity to give you an interview and let people know more about you. And Jess moved away as well, so yeah, <laughs> yeah, I moved. <laughs> no, I'm I'm actually very much up for and ready for an interview. Uh, awesome. It's been a long com- long time coming, but um, yeah, it's nice. It'd be nice to sort of reflect and and go over everything. So what got you interested in filmmaking? So originally I was interested in, in acting and um, so I followed that, that path for quite some time and uh, whenever you act on stage you kind of, there's both a charm to performing for so many nights and then it all being over but then there's also this kind of pain and for me the pain was a little bit too hard to bear so I knew stage acting was kind of not always going to be for me and I started to sort of look outside of that and I I pretty much most of my childhood was watching films and learning so much about human psychology and storytelling through film Um, so I started to think maybe I wanted to be a director and uh, I looked after that I kind of like it was like a proper light bulb moment where I really was just like this feels right this is you know a whole other side of things because it's the person behind the camera and I became really intrigued by looking into directors um, and yeah and how they made films you know and how they told stories and how they portrayed characters and plots and yeah it's just it was magic as soon as I um, looked at both from the performer side and the director because it's like a relationship really Mm. one is the eyes and the other is the body you know and together you as the actor you're portraying your own form of art um but as the director you're also uh including their art as yours and it's you're thinking so much bigger than that and film is the perfect playground for you to explore that kind of directing were there any particular films that kind of influenced your directors, as you said, that made you go, oh, I really want to, not like copy them, but you like to No, I get you. Style? There's been loads of influences, really. I mean, um, sometimes it's not necessarily the director. Sometimes it's, it's the film in general, like the specific film. And I really rate that possibly like the more of the team effort and how, 
how the combination of actors, directors, and, and crew, um, and post, you know, all the people that are involved, sometimes there's something that's just magic, and it's like the perfect crew, you know, yeah. and you can really see that in some movies, but maybe you don't resonate with their other work, so I've had plenty of uh, films that have had quite an impact on me, um, but there are obviously certain directors that also stand the test of time, and uh, you really you really see the them in their films and uh, it's, it, it's the, the the typical heroes you know the the, the typical top tier directors because you've got Tarantino who is unreplaceable mm. like he stands alone with his own style and it's gorgeous and it's it's playful and it's colorful and every character gets to shine ah, how can you not love that it's great yeah. and then you've also got um oh Jim, my brain's gonna really struggle now oh and uh, wes anderson yeah, yeah who the it's like a fairy tale every single story but the story's not a fairy tale the story's odd and peculiar and mm. but that's also the charm you know and wes anderson is very charming his his visuals are so they just make you happy you know you want to sit there and just go can we just hold that shot and just appreciate it because <laughs> that's gorgeous that's a Wes Anderson film and uh, yeah and then you've got films like Train Spotting uh, and and like Requiem for a Dream they really influenced me too because mm-hmm. they they make the audience feel what the characters feeling and they use drugs which is obviously like on screen someone doing drugs is um not very exciting and a little bit like eh, that's not something i want to see but you then add the illusion of what it might feel like to the equation and mm. and to show that but still somehow keep this uh reality not being too broken because you've using visuals that that really reflect a feeling and that encourages the audience to be like no no you're a part of this story too we want it's our job to make you see this and hear this and relate to the character in this way because you need to feel it to understand it that kind of leads us nicely into uh, your first short film. Now, I know, of course, your first yes. film was Lonely Hearts, but your first short film, which we'll talk about first, was, of course, mm-hmm. Arachnacid, which pretty yes. much everything you've just described encapsulates. Mm-hmm. I was in that. You were. <laughs> yeah, you were the star of mine, really. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> Level one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, and, and you're totally right. That's, so it was a perfect lead-in because uh, I really love... Not necessarily specifically drugs, <laughs> um, but I love the altered states of consciousness, um, and drugs happen to be a big part of um, of that world. You know, yeah. I am going to play in the future with more ways of that working, uh, like delusions, uh, sleep, uh, things like that. Mm. But I, I love that idea that there's uh, more than meets the eye going on you know and sometimes uh, a little uh, change in in your reality can really give you some perspective yeah uh, but if, can you repeat the question because I've totally derailed oh, no, no, <laughs> I just wanted we to were literally I said to enjoy you, that moment talk to us about arachnacid <laughs> and you've told us about arachnacid Oh, yeah, so Arachnacid is a, a, a short that I did uh, about uh, an acid trip that takes you through these layers, essentially, of uh, your, your world stripping down and away into something else. Because it doesn't just happen uh, straight away. There's, like, levels. But also the the final state which isn't necessarily pleasurable it's terrifying and then you, you can't quite get yourself out of it because you're still in your actual reality so it's this torture that can sometimes uh open up these other worlds 
like portals and you you can't really quite escape it and I think sometimes there's uh, a lot of horror that sits in in that because you've lost control well that again leads us really nicely into lonely hearts (laughs) which again we're talking about a similar thing because obviously lonely hearts is a reality show in a nihilist horrific world it's you know it's a horrible concept but it does have that idea of they think they're in a controlled environment. They think they're in control mm-hmm. because there's horror, much nastier things happening. So Definitely. Obviously, Lonely Hearts, you and I, uh, we shot it in, um, what was it? It was 2017. And mm. I remember like the reason why we wanted to do it because I had a distributor who was interested in industrial animals and I went with Troma and I was like, we should make a film for them. Let's do something with them. And Martin mm. um, obviously wanted to work with us on the next film. And we just sat down and start thinking about things and I know that you were very much interested in the reality TV side of things. Yeah. Yeah, so this this uh, was a little bit of me working through something, I guess, this whole film, as is everything in the end when you look back. But um, So when I was younger and probably until quite recently, I used to really get sucked into the world of reality TV show, probably because of the reasons I was thinking of before. Why I love film is, is, uh, it's a, you know, life's a stage. If you, if you start to look at it that way and, uh, watching people is something we all love to do and it's addictive and it's like, look at social media. It, it, you keep scrolling because you, you, you know, something's going to happen. And, um, but it's not always good content. And sometimes it's actually quite barbaric to watch, like, but you watch, you know? If it was a normal social situation, sometimes you would be like, oh no, do you know what, that's not my drama. I, I won't, it's rude to watch kind of thing. Um, but as soon as it's televised, people's social lives are up for grabs, you know? You have kind of signed you know, your, your life away. It's like signing yourself up, signing your soul over to the devil in some ways. And it, it really started to hit me that it was so poisonous when you see these people who have this sharp rise into fame and everyone loves them and then they just crash. And it's 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 not pretty you know um and that happens over and over and over and over again because it like churns them out churns these people out because they're fame they're like fame hungry and the people see they don't necessarily think about the the after part they just think fame um but then it also started to get ugly on the inside like people were being more and more racy to get attention to be noticed and like people were just having sex on tv randomly one night and i remember this this being on a Big Brother Live, and it really stuck with me, because I remember just thinking, like, I'm sat here babysitting, and this is fucked up. <laughs> and then you've got Geordie Shaw, people casually pissing themselves, and having sex on TV, but it's okay. And people are sitting there watching this with their children. <laughs> but it's like, oh, my God, this is normal. And then you've got Caroline Flack who suddenly kills herself and other people who kill themselves, you know, and it's not, it's not something that anyone's slowing down on either. And to me, it was just like, wow, this needs to be like, people need to see how ugly this is, dangerous this is, and out of hand, out of control this is. And that's Lonely Hearts. I was going to say, it's really interesting. That's Lonely Hearts. (laughs) Jess, it's really interesting you kind of touch on that because I remember, um, like, we're obviously a similar age and growing up, I I remember, like, when Big Brother first came out, it was just about Uh getting random people into a house and let's see how it kind of develops over a a amount of weeks. Um, But then by the end of, like, Big Brother, after, like, the 13th one or whatever it was... Uh That you, you kind of you don't see the behind the scenes where you know the production team are actually trying to deliberately get chaotic people into yeah. the one house to cause that um yeah you know to cause that fire to add and fuel into that 
to sort of create drama. This and that's sort of what Lonely Hearts is. Well, it's the thing. Uh, when we wrote it, we wanted to write those certain characters that we knew that those sort of shows like, thrive on. And, of course, the, the bigger thing with Lonely Hearts, spoilers and all that, is that there is a much more nefarious group that want to see all the drama and the darkness and the horrific actions that happen within the film. Yeah, they've paid for it. Yeah, it's a paid-for experience. Yeah. But it was a really cool experience filming it, because I remember, like, when we... The original plan, because it's cool to give all the behind the scenes now, was that <laughs> you and I wrote it and you were going to star in it. Mm. Yeah, um, it was going to be Penelope, the yeah. presenter. Yeah, and of course, um, you took on... Well, you, you, not of course, but you took on a job and you were like, I don't think yeah. I'm going to do it. And I was like, okay, all right, whatever's... We'll, we'll try and work out something. And then we got Sophie involved. And then you left the job. So you came back as a co-director. <laughs> and it all worked out perfectly. Yeah, I know. I was... I'm always like this, Awana. I'm always like, yeah, this is what I'm doing now. <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs> um, yeah, my life was like here, there and everywhere at that point. So I really had, had a hard time like committing myself to things. But I'm so, so grateful that everything that happened at that time happened, you know, mm. because um, I think I gave so much more as a director um, and for my first feature, you know, I, I think it would have probably been a bit overwhelming for me to have done both acting and directing in the first film. But as you know, uh, the second I wanted to, I wanted to do that because it was like, um, no, I, I think I could, you know, mm. whereas I'm glad for the first one. Because also Sophie did such a good job, she did. you know, she, she was the perfect character for it. Was you know, she really got it. Well, the thing. We, we had a great cast and we had like, we shot it over three days. And I think, because, you, you know, that was your first film and it's it's a very extreme film, of course, um, which is like really crazy and brave to go for. And like, I'm happy with what we... I know, I must be nuts. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <Yeah. We're> just... <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> but the thing is, I, I know that obviously we'd, we'd worked on some other similar kind of films with um, another mm -hmm. filmmaker, Martina, which we'll talk a bit more in the acting sense. But from Lonely Hearts, obviously, we started going to the festivals. Um, we got it out to Dark Side, which was our first Dark yeah. Side release. And then when we followed up with The Truth Will Out, we took in a very different angle, which mm -hmm. works so much more in its favour. And it's, I think you've always summed up of how you use more extreme elements like sex or violence as to like... Well, you, you, you explain. You explain. Okay. So... So I've always, I've always loved those awkward moments that, ah, they, it's like a window into a moment rather than, you, you, I want, I want those moments to make you feel something, you know, and sometimes, um, in movies when they're kind of, ah, I don't know, like they either avoid showing you something or they, they show you just enough, just enough not to put you out out of your comfort zone, you know, and, and for me, that's actually robbing you from the truth of that moment. And, and people need to see this stuff because it's only then that they will let it sink in that this stuff happens, mm. you know, and people love to, to turn a blind eye to this stuff and pretend it doesn't because it's uncomfortable and it's ugly. And if you can, if you can not lose your audience, but still, subject them to something that makes them uncomfortable so they learn something new and understand the the power and knowledge you know like the the i feel like i've i'm going to be a better person because this has changed the way i think or feel about something or i'm i now maybe can understand certain things better and it's like i actually think those moments need to be seen to be believed. Well, it's if in, in our particular films, it was all about within context as well, because you see everything in Lonely Hearts, and that was because of the reality TV element. Yeah. But when we go to The Truthful Out, you don't really see anything, and it's more about seeing the expression of the person who has to experience the abuse, yes. rather than seeing it through the abuser's eyes, which I think works so beautifully. Yeah. Or not beautifully, <laughs> disturbingly. No, I, I, I'll give you the, the most most messed up thing. So we, we we actually did that take twice. So the first take, 
we had to stop because <laughs> Kayla got really put off, not by <laughs> not by the creepiness of the of the scene, no, by me <laughs> grinning in the darkness. <laughs> Like a psychopath. Like, who smiles their head off at a scene like that? <laughs> but I was smiling working. because it was like, oh, yeah, this is so uncomfortable. And it felt real, you know, like, that's why I was smiling. But, um, yeah, that was my fault. So I messed up that scene by being a big creep. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, so um, so ask the question again for me, so I'll completely, like, again. Oh, no, I don't just... <laughs> more, more I moved it on to talk about the truth or out. Not necessarily a question, more of a segment. Mm. So, oh, right, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, the truth or out. <laughs> this chapter. We shot um, November 2018, and we shot it in uh, Jack's place, or our home, where we're recording right now. Well, not... Crash Arts HQ. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's <laughs> the other one, that's how it's called. And you, it was really cool of it, because like, cause Jack gave you the freedom to design it how you wanted. We got mm. to make it feel like it was an actual kind of family home. Yeah, it's funny. So I did one run, I think, wasn't it, to a charity shop. So I, I, yeah. I literally just ran in and out that morning before I came to yours, which is day one of the shoot. And I already kind of, because I know your your home, uh, I know how I kind of wanted it to look already, you know. Yeah. And uh, it, I, charity shops, you know, but like what better place to make something feel like a home than a stuff made by stuff that was in, in someone's home once, <laughs> you know, and like, then all of a sudden, Jack found those paintings. Do you remember? Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. They're still and that, there. that for me was the moment I was like, yes, these are getting everywhere in this house. So uh, throughout the film, uh, you can see these paintings, uh, and obviously not to mention the, the the main one that you've got in your collection of paintings, which oh, yes, uh, <laughs> became quite a statement item, I think, in some of the shots. And the the China doll, which I kept, I don't know why. <laughs> I can't let it go. A memento. Yeah, a bit creepy. <laughs> um, yeah, and. Uh, yeah, I've kept quite a bit, actually, if I think about it. Like, I tend to keep a, f a few things because they kind of, I don't know, they look a little bit like, oh, that, that reminds me of that, you know. And uh, it was nice. I think you've still got some of the paintings as well, haven't you? They're yeah, still yeah. up. Yeah, they're still there. Yeah, see? <laughs> it's, it's, Not it's, just a set designer. <laughs> yeah. I'm a house designer. <laughs> I always find it interesting with Truthful Out because we did because it was more about the characters, if anything, and the corruption mm. on so many different levels within like the Me Too time, which was always weird because obviously we did Lonely Hearts just before everything all that happened, yeah. and then we were more influenced by the Me Too movement approaching the Truthful Out, and I don't know, like it's it's interesting to see how audiences respond to that. Having seen Lonely Hearts, they always go. Oh, I thought it'd be a little bit more, but if they haven't seen mm. Lonely Hearts, they, they, they take it as being what it's supposed to be, a disturbing experience. Yeah, it's funny how, like you said, there is always this comparison when people have got Lonely Hearts in their mind. And it's like, it's, it's funny because it's like, there are similar themes. It's not that we haven't got those moments, you know, mm. as you know. Um, but it is funny because it's like the, the design of story is totally different and and yeah I think with Lonely Hearts it was more of an interest because like reality TV show like it's a wide spectrum you can play with on that you know yeah, yeah. Um, whereas The Truth Will Out I already knew who the characters were going to be based around the girls the witches um, and that that was heavily researched you know but that was that was the first time that i I kind of um, wanted to, to honour something else, you know. It was more like that. So a lot of the the story elements were kind of inspired by the Me Too movement, but mm. the characters were more were more. Uh, well, I don't know, I, well, iconic. I'd say some ways because of the research and, and who they really are you know well, this is it. it's you, a modern version of you were playing with that the archetypes of certain types of witches mm. whereas of course from me and Jackson's perspective and obviously Kev's perspective 
I was thinking about those, you know, those those figures who try to put like a pleasant face across, but in reality, they're just horrible people who abuse yeah. their positions of power. So it's nice to kind of like, yeah, mix Looking between the, the two. Next best story. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to move on to your acting career now. Okay. Acted in, <laughs> the funny thing is you've acted in a lot of films, you know, you've acted in, uh, you were the lead in Conspiracy X, you've, you had mm. a cameo in Toxic Schlock, um, you've appeared in numerous other of, um, uh, shorts and stuff. There's loads of them. I'm not gonna name them all. Um, you're appearing in The Unwanted. Which... Yeah, you're in Ryan's uh, new mm-hmm. film as well. Um, what is it about? Like, is there any particular kind of roles that you've really enjoyed, or is there stuff that you want to do more with acting, or is the attention more to directing now? Oh, so I I do still have you know the hunger for acting because for me it's like I said it's it's the it's the two sides of the coin. It's um. There, it depends on which one I'm better suited at. You know, like if, if there's a character that really no one else could play except for me, then I would have no, you know, I have to do it, you know. Yeah. And that's why it was so hard because um, there was a character, as you know, um, that I really was hungry for. Like I'm so in the right place to, to mentally try and work with a psychopath. Yeah. Um, character I feel like I could really enjoy that <laughs> and um, and I think the type of performer that I am the way that I get into a certain state of mind that kind of character is very well suited to me and, and my style um, whereas a director I can kind of I, there's more scope for me like I can I can uh, I can be the eyes for the actors, so it's like I see them how how the audience is going to see them. So it's more like I'm playing with their identity rather than mine. Yeah. Whereas acting, I really enjoy those moments when I really identify with the character. But I think I'm very aware as a performer, I can only really stretch myself so far. Um, I've got kind of a narrow field and I think it's because of my eyes <laughs> I think it's because I've got the, I've got a certain face that that I can I can switch to evil quite quickly by just a certain look you well, know and I should play I want to play with that I don't get to do it every day <laughs> well just to um, just to mention about The Unwanted which is a film we've got coming out this year that Ryan directed you played the yes. bad guy perfectly. We took it in mm-hmm. that document. Spoiler. <laughs> well, no, it's a big twist. <laughs> <laughs> it's just interesting because obviously that's a docu horror, and after directing to and then performing as the lead as one, taking almost that that Kev role or um, the role um, that Sophie does in Lonely Hearts. It was interesting yeah. to see you do it, and it worked. Can I can I just say something on that as well, Jess? Yeah. What I find really interesting with that is whenever me and Sam were writing the unwanted. And the focus was meant to be on, like, Bella's character. But as we started filming and, um, you know, we, we quickly realised that the central character was your character. Yeah. Oh, no way! Yeah, so now when we watch it back, you are, like, the <laughs> focus. spoiler point. for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. Which, which is, like, really cool from a director's point of view, whenever you kind of, you've got a vision mm. and it kind of changes for the better mm. from the shoot. But that's what happens when you've got good character actors. And also because, as you know, we all work within improv and that, that's always um, kind of helped to be able to make it more collaborative, as you were saying at the beginning, with actors. Yeah. So what's next? Oh. What's next? Dun, 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 dun. Well, uh, so I've started having a... Pl- I'm trying to think of like, hmm, do I want to give big spoilers? Just give or a little enticing. Smaller spoilers. Appetite. Okay. So um, there are certain ideas. There are certain ideas that are in the uh, what do you call it? Where you you, you keep them, the you keep them just stashed, you know, and and you can kind of you kind of can pull up pull them up when the moment arises. Like you know, oh, a few God. of them. Like I've got um, some ideas that if I get the right cast, if mm. I get the right location, I'm doing it. <laughs> um, and crew, of course, obviously, if I get the right crew. Um, but there's, there is an idea at the moment that I'm thinking is uh, something that I'm particularly drawn to. And you know that feeling when when an idea starts to 
uh, get into your mind like a bit of a, a bit like a parasite, you know, and and you kind of think, oh, yeah, that one seems to be taking my interest, so I'm going to start working with it. Um, and it's it's to do, it's actually it would, it's a perfect follow up, really, in some ways to to um, the research that I was doing when I did the Truth Will Out. Ah, yes, and yeah. Uh, yeah, you kind of know what I'm talking about, now, mm. don't you? So I'm, I really like the uh, the three. The three um, goddesses, the phases, you know, that, that that women go through, and particularly drawn to the crone figure. And uh, there's not a huge amount of um, of horror that plays on um, the psychological element, including from an old woman's perspective. Yeah. I think Requiem for a Dream did a fucking amazing job of that though. <laughs> that's the that's the main that's the only one that I can think of that's like, oh wow, that is a horror like moment, you know. Mm. Um she was the worst one for me out of all of those characters. Anyway, I digress. But yeah, and uh there's also this this uh superior nature of the crone that hasn't always been portrayed in in modern films anyway. Mm or modern stories because she's strong um whereas normally you'll see like the the older ladies will either be like some kind of creepy ghost or a uh, zombie or um and don't get me wrong these these gals can be scary when when they're in that state too but i like the idea of seeing someone who's uh, almost zeus like powerful yeah. you know who's really stepped into herself and that's supposed to be the crone stage you know like she's supposed to be this mystic and and you know she, you, you want to be on her good side kind of thing but if she's on her bad side like you know she's super she's supreme so that's what i'm playing with at the moment and um i, I really I, I took a lot of inspiration from midsummer when we went to see it yeah, yeah, that's cool. and uh, i feel like that did a very good job of something that I'm, I'm sort of, oh, that's something I'm, I'm quite keen on, that kind of uh, tradition, that, that kind of daylight feeling of, like, this is normal to these people, but this is messed up, you know. Um, but do you go along with it? And it's that kind of, again, the psychological, your reality is shifting before your very eyes. Things are happening that, that you would never imagine to happen. And... Um, yeah, so there's there's so much to play with because <laughs> it's it's it takes you all the way to like this research that I'm doing with the the, the crone. It takes you all the way back to certain ceremonies and the Greeks and and things like that. And yeah, I'm very excited. This could be this could be something I'm doing next. I believe. It's always exciting. Just gotta when find you're my way. <laughs> <laughs> no, that sounds really cool. I'm going to ask you the, the last question I always ask everyone. Now, taking consideration that you have the greatest budget, you can do whatever you want. It's a fantasy mm. idea. Don't think too literal. What would be your dream project? Oh, gosh. It could be based on a book or a remake or it could be an original idea, whatever. Mm. That's so tough. To work with Sam again. <laughs> oh, that, well, that, that doesn't need to be a dream. We know that we'll have that. It's yeah. like, it's already in the books, you know? It's one of those things. Uh, I'm trying to think. Like, I always like the idea of doing... I've always wanted to do something based off of a true story. Um, mm. Or like some kind of person that, that you'd love to honour, you know? Um... And I think, yeah, I don't, I don't know exactly. That's a good question. Really should think about that. It's good though, because it means that at some point something's going to hit you where you're like, one day I'm going to make that. And the fact oh, that you really... I know who. I know. I would love to work with Gaspar No. Good choice. Yes. It's a French. Imagine film. making a film with him. Yeah, that would be an intense. <laughs> that would be nuts. Well, it depends. He, he, might, he might mellow by the time you know. You know, he's getting old. All the more for him to teach me all his tricks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or Clint Eastwood. I would love to. That's, if I could be in Clint that's Eastwood. That's extreme alternative. Yeah. I know. I'm sorry. Well, let's charge the pit. I just, he's I like, I like those kind of. I, I like Gaspar No to me is like, is like a party boy, but he from the 70s. You know what I mean? Like he, he's got this kind of like, 
point of view that you're like, whoa, I really want to see the world you do. And just like the chaos of it. Like it's like if you worked with him, you imagine that it's like it's like someone taking you to a really cool party. <laughs> <laughs> um, whereas Clint Eastwood, he's got this grit, you know, and he's got this almost like historical value to him because he's also been an actor um, and of a certain time. Um, and I, I really enjoy his characters. Uh, like he's he. He doesn't necessarily, like, I like characters that aren't necessarily likeable. And I think he, he always writes characters like that. Like, they're not, they're not, um, they're far more believable, and yet they're not necessarily likeable. Well, that's something I didn't know about you, about Clint Eastwood and Gus Yeah. Young, so, yeah. Thank you so much for joining <laughs> us, Jess. Um, yeah, you can check out, like, The Truthful Out and Lonely Hearts via Dark Side Releasing. The Truthful Out is actually now on Amazon Prime. So you can just sure go there, and there it is. If you're in the UK, it's coming out in America and uh, Canada soon, but it's definitely in the UK. I know that for sure. But yeah, thank you very much for joining us, and I can't wait to hear about whatever you're creating, and I hope you never stop creating because you're good. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Jess. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Have a good one. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> bye. So, guys, hope you enjoyed that interview. It was really fun to talk to Jess. Um, so, this week, guys, as part of our auteur season, we wanted to discuss another director, um, and this week we decided to go with Darren Aronofsky. Um, so, for you guys, I know that you guys absolutely love Darren Aronofsky. Yeah, yeah. I think one of my favourite films by him was probably one of his first, or at least his like most critically acclaimed, which is Requiem for a Dream. Um, and I think one of the major things that stands out for me with that film is the style and just mm. the way that the drugs and stuff are portrayed. We kind of touched on this last week, um, and I know we sort of discussed it with Jess, and um, the, the way that like drug taking isn't necessarily a, a nice thing because obviously the repercussions of it afterwards, but the way that that's shot and the way that it's configured and edited, like that quick consecutive takes of all these different things happening, I just thought it was absolutely... Amazing. Well, that's what I think. I, I think Darren Aronofsky is is so good at is that he he perfects that sort of technicality of the filmmaking uh, at the same time as as really perfecting the, the the narrative and all of those things. It doesn't feel like he has gone in uh, style over substance ever, um, but there's still such a style to his films. It's uh, yeah. It's funny because with Requiem for a Dream, that was his uh, second film. It's very much described as a film that's style over substance. Really? And it's, it surprised me because there's loads of substance in there. Yeah, they were taking substances constantly. <laughs> <laughs> but he, he, with that film, he, um, with the editing in particular, like you said, he knows how to get the flow of like each drug as well. Because each drug obviously gives different effects, in particular with um, Ellen Brinstein's character with the old lady. Mm. When she's taking those different yeah. pills to lose the weight, Sometimes it's an upper, sometimes it's a downer. And the way he does that, it's like there's that beautiful shot, which is um, it's a side continuous shot and the camera's speeding up and she's just cleaning through the house like a crazy person. And then when she crashes, everything slows down. And it's just so perfectly toned because you're like, like oh, your own heart goes up by watching all those crazy actions. And of course it's got to slow at some point. That's what a drug has to do. Yeah. And he just perfectly like kind of got it. It's one of those films that just... I, when I was when I had when I was young and the films to watch to get into films that was on the list and I've watched that film so many times and a lot of people can't watch that film so many times because <laughs> it's a very depressing film but it's so good and it's so striking and it's the one film where all the performances are excellent from actors you don't expect to be brilliant like Marlon Wayans I thought you were going to say Jared Leto well no Jared Leto's not a great actor but that was his good time but Marlon Wayans this is the guy from Scary Movie yeah <laughs> and yet he's fucking brilliant as that drug dealer character Mm. They've all just, you just feel that kind of, that desperation from all of it, which is obviously what drugs are linked to anyway. Any addiction is some sort of form of desperation to a degree. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think that that's, that's something, you know, I, Darren Aronofsky tends to touch on this sub, uh, subject in his, in his films of, of trying to reach perfection. Yeah. And I think addiction is, is part of that, like, in the, in the first place. Yeah, and yeah. it's quite an interesting way that he's looked at that, is that they're looking for the perfect high constantly and, and they're never quite achieving mm. it because it's unreachable. Which, um, for, to go to his first film quickly, Pi, 
which is like such a head fuck, it's amazing. But it's the same kind of thing. It's about <clears throat> having some sort of message from God or getting close to God or perfection or whatever the higher state is. Mm -hmm. And, and people wanting the same thing as you, and can you handle that yourself? And I think, yeah, it always comes back to that kind of, can you handle that level of fame or that level of success or that level of a high in Requiem's sense? Yeah, and I think I think it goes further than that because it almost like questions, uh, like in a lot of his film, like you, you look at Black Swan and The Wrestler, um, is that perfection ever achievable? And if Ooh. it is, what is the cost of it? Um, and you know he always he he always plays in into that, and it's it, it really makes uh, something really compelling that makes you question uh, you know your own sort of desires, what you want to achieve, and what you want to be good at, and what the cost mm. is of those things. Well, it's interesting with those two films as well because they're they're technically sports films in some ways, or yeah. not sports, but, you know, some sort of competitiveness because mm. you've got the the athletic. Yeah, you've got the athleticness with um, the wrestler of hitting that peak and then what happens after the peak. And then with the ballerina, it's spending your whole life trying to get to the peak of being the best and the toughness of what it takes on with you. Mm. Which, you know, like he's, he's also, he gets the best performances out of actors. He generally gets the Oscar nominations out of the actors. Ellen Brunstein was nominated for Requiem for a Dream. Mickey Rock should have won, got nominated for the wrestler. And he won with Natalie Portman for uh, Black Swan. Yeah. He knows how to put those actors in these real vulnerable positions where, you know, they've really got to, like, find those layers underneath. I think it's really interesting as well, because with The Wrestler, mm. he kind of almost took a gamble, didn't he, by bringing Mickey Rourke in? Yeah. Like, I suppose if you talk about typecasting, he pretty much took a, a downbeat, like, washed-up person, yeah. arguably, and put him into a character that was a downbeat, washed up wrestler. And it, 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 I don't know, the symmetry there. It's like, you know, there's parallels that, oh, real life and the acting and uh, or the character. And um, it just worked really naturally. And it made the film that much better. I think if you were to take like a Johnny Depp or, you know, a Brad Pitt or, I don't know, Tom Cruise and put him in that role, yeah, it yeah. wouldn't have had the same impact. Yeah, That's it, it was the right time. Sometimes the castings are just perfect in that regard. They hit certain people in the right point. Because you have to remember, before The Wrestler, Arnavoski did The Fountain. Yeah. And The Fountain yeah. was one of his biggest commercial failures and was a nightmare to produce. Because originally he had Cate Blanchett and Brad Pitt. And it was a much higher budget, but the whole thing collapsed. So he had to reduce the budget and it still didn't really hit people. It's only now that it's considered to be great. Like back then, there was like booing and stuff during its screenings. Jeez, really? Yeah, because it was just too out there to that's, take it all in, you know? That's so strange. I, and I mean, I, I think that I can understand why that film wouldn't do well commercially because when you think of the uh, how to market uh, the fountain, yeah. I, I wouldn't even it's know where to start. Three different time periods and it stuff. Is, and and so like how it's, you... Yeah, and, and it's like a... a a pretty basic storyline throughout all three of them, but at the same time, it gives sort of room to to explore that uh, idea of the tree of life and and uh, the characters and the way that they're trying to obtain that. And, and yeah, it's like, but I, if, if it was brought to you and you said like, "Oh, cut together a trailer that will give the audience yeah. a certain amount," like, what? How? Oh, yeah. <laughs> how would you be able to do that? I'd love to watch the trailer back now and see yeah. <laughs> exactly what it was. Well, that's the, it's the same thing with Mother. When Mother came out, obviously the trailer made it look like it was a horror film. Let's and, not talk about Mother. <laughs> and it was, and it was not. A, and I mean, it was horrific, but yeah, it wasn't yeah. a horror film. It's always um, been mismarketing with him. Apart from Black Swan, Black Swan yeah. knew how to market it. Even Requiem did because he knew how to like bring in those hyper stylized um, editing shots of the eyes and the functions and stuff. It's just. He's one of those. He weighs, he's one of the old school auteurs who flirts with the Hollywood system, but they still don't know what to do with him. Yeah, and it never really works out. There's lots of failed projects. He was going to do Batman at one point with Clint Eastwood, was and it? yeah, yeah, that would have been awesome. But he, he, his pitch was like too dark for it, apparently. Yeah, was... Commissioner Gordon was going to kill himself in the opening scene. That would have been cool. Yeah. <laughs> and it would have been really interesting yeah. as a Batman, yeah. Well, so he, he planned to do that around 2002, so this was just bef just after the debacle that is Batman versus Batman Robin, and before Nolan could take it to a more serious level. So the industry wasn't ready to do that with comic books, yeah. yeah. But he also must did the Wolverine. But that kind of fell apart when there was the um, tsunami in Japan. It, it's interesting with Darren Aronofsky, because... 
I, I, like you think of his films, a lot of them are very motivated by his own influence. Like he kind of comes up with an idea, or you know, he gets a, an idea and then runs with it. He he doesn't really ever adapt anything. So like Wolverine or Batman would have been a completely different field for him. I suppose Black well, Swan, you could argue, like he's adapted. I, well, actually, the odd thing about that is. Um, he didn't write Wrestler. He didn't write Black Swan. And he didn't write Requiem for, Requiem for a Dream. Requiem for a Dream is based on a book. But he got the author to co-write the script with him. Oh. So that's why it's like as close as possible to the source material. Right. So I think he does in that sense, like if he's going to adapt something, he's going to try and get the original source material involved. If that but, makes sense. Yeah, no, that makes sense. But like you think of stuff that's quite big. You think of directors these days who are doing... You know, you think of Nolan, he adapts loads of different sort of screenplays. So, um, he's not franchise heavy, basically. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. That, yeah, I suppose that's where I'm kind of going with it. He's never really done anything that's a, a franchise or like um, adapted anything that's a franchise. It's source material that is very unique and individual. Well, the closest he's ever got to having a big budget franchise film was Noah. Yeah. And that was still adapted from a short story that he wrote when he was like 13, which is very much to do with the environment. And he held on to it. He, he wrote it as a comic book originally. He tried to get money for it throughout the 2000s. It's only when Black Swan made so much money and got all the, the award recognition that he was in the position to choose his dream project. And it just happened to be Noah. Yeah. And of course, that was a, a marketing nightmare as well. Yeah. I mean, they, they weren't sure what to do with it because this is, you know, it's a biblical story. Yeah. But it's, it's, not, uh, it's not a sort of Christian telling or, or, a, or a religious telling of, of the a trailer biblical story. It. Yeah, it, it's, it was it was very kind of hit and miss for it's, me. It it's didn't... very dark and intense and and moody and uh, it, psychological. Yeah, but at yeah. that time I was massive into Russell Crowe, um, but I, I, I don't know the trailer just didn't give me any kind of a hook to sort of want to watch the film. That's again miss marketing, and I think Arnavoski, because <clears throat> you can see after that with Mother, like he was with Jennifer Lawrence, so they got that major star to be able to take that story and actually make it. There's a very there's a lot of people always talk about that Mother is the last time a studio will ever take any sort of extreme risk like that, mm. like get those sort of names in and just tell a story like that because the film was expensive, yeah, mostly because of the actors cost quite a bit, whereas of course it's just a one location in that complete, but it was just one of those things that yeah it's one of those big risks that Hollywood doesn't like to make, mm. and it didn't pay off. There was no awards, there was no critical reception to Mother was very mixed. Although now it's considered to be one of the great films of the last ten years. At the time, it was like, well, what is this? What are you trying to say here? And it's obvious what he's saying. It's a fucking, look what we're doing to the world. Yeah, yeah. And, and the thing is, is when you, when you like spend a bit of time thinking about it and, and you sort of like have a discussion about it, it becomes more and more apparent how like obvious it is that it's a discussion about climate change and, and uh, the problems that man and humans have, have yeah. uh, caused on the, on the planet. I can take Javier Bardem <coughs> in any other film, but know what happens in Mother. So I haven't seen Mother, but I know <laughs> exactly what happens. And having kids and stuff, I just I don't it's think It's like I the least it. thing in the Yeah, world. yeah, it's such it's a tiny, tiny part. Yeah, but bug. it still happens. Well, it does. You can't yeah, get used but... to children dying in films, man. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to get used to anything. If it, if it upsets me, then like I'm entitled to sort of we're stay gonna, away from we're it. We're going to do the, the clockwork orange thing with you. <laughs> keep your eyes open and make you watch. <laughs> Tie me to the chair. Yeah. <laughs> It's funny, we might be joking about that, but like, Arnavoski to me is one of those last extreme directors who yeah. can filter into mainstream cinema. Like Lynch was, like Cronenberg was, those kind of guys who made those films back in the day, they can't get the funding or they're not going to bother to go to the studios. Like, you know, Lynch is going to Netflix. Arnavoski still tries to work within the studio system. And the fact that he's announced that dramedy with Brendan Fraser, sure, it's a bit of a curve, but it's going to be his angle towards it. And that's what's always exciting. You're always actually going to get an angle towards it. It's never going to feel like, where's the creativity? Where's the Arnavoski touch? Yeah. Well, that's the thing with, like, I, I think that the problem with, with uh, directors like uh, Aronofsky and why they are sort of like, why they're not getting that sort of studio attention is because, like, the, the artful, like, being artful and, and uh, creating a, a film like Mother or like Noah, um, 
it's just incompatible with the marketing really because yeah. like they want to put it into like boxes and say oh you know no that's for a christian audience and so they throw christian rock over yeah, it instead yeah, of yeah. like using the original score and you think like how how can they watch that film and think that that will work but it's because they 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 need to put it into boxes otherwise they don't know where to you know go to where yeah. where what tv shows uh, tv channels to put it on and and where to target their marketing I think times have changed as well. Uh, if you think about like um, Lynch or um, Aronofsky, like their generation coming up through cinema, I suppose there wasn't a tight leash on it as what you would argue you would have now. There wasn't um, so much of a franchise that has to make. Yeah, money, but also, you know? yeah, it, it's always about making money. If you do something that's slightly a curveball or a little bit, if you think. Like if if Black Swan was pitched in twenty twenty one, I don't think it would receive the same reception. Oh, I think it from would've. studios as what it did back then. It's like, a horror though, and the thing is, Black Swan was a risk in itself. It was actually that's what I'm saying. It's because it's risky. Yeah, and because the studio then They're taking would, less risks now. I yeah, think. <laughs> the studio is a lot more like um, let's call them baby face. Like they got a show face, so mm. they they want to make as much money back off their investment as possible. So they're not willing to take them risks. Well, it's like ten years ago, eleven years ago, slightly different, probably longer than that. Because he's one of those like, like fortunate directors who have got in a position where the talent still want to work with him, and it, that's why you get like Jennifer Lawrence in the film, or Natalie Portman, or Russell Crowe, or Hugh Jackman. They're big names. But they want to do those stories. And I think that's why he's still got some sort of position and the fact that Black Swan made a whole lot of money. Yeah, well, that's the thing is if a studio sees a big name uh, actor sort of interested or, or, or already signed up for the role, they're more likely to put funding in, aren't they? Because, the, you know, they think that's, that that's more marketable. Uh, it's a weird that's one, one, isn't it? That's one, like, director who's yeah. got the pull. If you think about any other director who is a little bit outlandish or wants to do something that's slightly different that isn't what the studio necessarily yeah. wants you don't have that as much anymore it's a lot of sif yeah plays. I mean that's what that's what a lot of um, auteurs would argue and that's so why is, is yeah, lucky like, in that sense Cronenberg's another one for example that hasn't been able to get funding no. because of because of the way that they just won't take the risk anymore and I think like that's the thing Aronofsky feels like the because he's not actually that he's not that old even though he's been no, making no. films he's like for, in his 50s yeah he's been around the same time as Christopher Nolan yeah really yeah they that's literally mad. their first film came out the same year ah. see the, that's the thing is that Aronofsky's really like uh, the last of a sort of uh, a dying I don't know, age yeah a dying age of directors <laughs> that I mean I'm hoping it will come maybe back maybe American be nice. yeah because yeah. I'd say there's still a lot of ambitious creative directors who do get oh, studio jobs but as far as American directors are concerned they're eaten up by the, the you know the Disney's the Marvel's couldn't the tell DC's. you any of the new like decent directors up well, and coming Jordan Peele Robert Eggers well, yeah, Jordan, Pe uh, Jordan Peele is absolutely excellent in a horror field yeah like uh, that's something else there are a lot of alternate starting to rise up again the fact that because of the mess that is the studio system you're going to see more of that one of the other things just to go back to Arnavosky like as in his films one of the things we haven't mentioned, and it's always key with any of his films, music. Yeah. Clint Mansell. Clint Mansell has pretty much scored every single one of his films, not Mother, but everything else is Clint Mansell. Mm. And I've, I personally, like, I love his music to, to, to a crazy amount. Like, Requiem for a Dream is such a stunning bit of music. The, the, yeah, that is just... It, it, there's something about it that really, really just resonates and, mm. and can make you feel a lot. like, And that's why they use it so much in other things oh, as well. Like, it's so annoying yeah. how they blast the sound first, that so. I first heard that song and it must have been like, I don't know if it was fan made or like it was legit, but they did it for a Two Towers trailer. Lord of the Rings Two Towers oh, so yeah. I, I thought it was associated with Lord of the Rings <laughs> and, and then it was years later when I actually finally sat down and watched Rec Room for a Dream I was like oh it's from Rec Room it's called Rec Room for, it's for the film like, oh, but they, they use it in like things like X Factor no, and I know, yes. all the time it's, <laughs> it's such oh. a powerfully beautiful bit of music it's the same with The, the Fountain again it's that beauty, mm. that real epicness but then there's real tender moments which is what Clint Mansell does so well and like every film, even The Wrestler, there's not a lot of music in The Wrestler, but there's it's that guitar of, riff. Somber. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's Slash. Slash from Guns N' Roses did that guitar riff, but it's composed by Clint Mansell. Nice. So it's still the elements of him in it. 
And I, I think that, you know, um, in, in a way, Mother stands out because of its lack of a score. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and that was a really interesting decision for them to make because there's no moment that you sort of um, have of... of reflection in that film where you just have a moment of music or, or you know the music leads a, a way that you feel it's so um uh, it feels so real uh despite it being a sort of absurdist story uh Ooh. that that you know it doesn't fit into sort of the real world um th but you you really feel that emotion because you're just locked with those characters talking and they're so fucking irritating the humans <laughs> <laughs> it's the thing I always find Varnovsky like he can do some real extreme imagery that you never forget like when um, Natalie Bull Portman is masturbating and then she looks up and her mother's sitting in the room mm. and it's like whoa and it stays with you those real shocking moments but then there's those real like tender moments there's a lot of stuff in Requiem for a Dream where it's just Jared Leto and Jennifer Connelly and then the music's so soft and warm and they're just like close to each other and he uses split screen for them to be able to touch themselves and it's these real tender, loving moments. He is capable of some real, I suppose, like almost not not romantic ideas, but just warmth. Intense. Human warmth, you know? But he likes to blend them into extreme, horrible, downward spirals. And also a real dark sense of humour. Yeah. Reckoning for a Dream is technically his funniest film. <laughs> Even though it's horrific, there are some lines in that film that you can't help but go, that is comedy gold. <laughs> ass to ass... Yeah. <laughs> or uh, when the, I know I look pretty babe but I didn't bring it out for air golden lines of real darkness where you don't feel like it's fitting but he throws it in he does it in pie and he does it in a lot of his films it's always real yeah I'd like to see what he actually did with a comedy so it'd be interesting to see what he does with Brendan Fraser but yeah questionable because he adds that absurdism and absurdism is a horrific thing at times isn't it it's not just about oh this is silly and a bit weird and a bit outside of our norm it's taking you to, to such an extreme and he does that consistently even in like the lighting with the um as to ass scene it's very similar to what he does with the fridge scene so you're like is this real or is this just one nightmarish hallucination of the experience that they're all going through with the drugs well i think that's something that again like he does he does really well is balance out that that darkness with uh, light moments because I, I think that's what makes those moments so dark as well mm. or so sort of um, impactful is that you know you have the light around it to be able to recognise that dark moment and to see it as it uh, you know to, to truly sort of feel it yeah, yeah. Um, whereas if you've just got something continuously dark it doesn't it just doesn't feel like that anymore it just feels like it's it, you know and that's it in Requiem it's that sense of love and that sense of like family it's, mm. that, it's that bond of the, the closeness because they all want it like the, the mother with the father and of course the relationship and that sort of thing but the addiction is going to take over all of those elements yeah he, he, he does a bit of a sledgehammer approach in Noah because it's dark here's hell on earth or it's light here's the doves and the innocence and all that kind yeah. of stuff it's a bit too heavy handed but then that's because you know it's the, the bible yeah the source <laughs> material is pretty pretty like that <laughs> good old bible <laughs> but I think he's he's one of those unique aut auteurs out there and I hope he does constantly get films I know he's very much involved with doing documentary work for the environment that seems to be a, a big focus on it and that's no problem there really but he, I don't want him to get lost with some of the other filmmakers that I worry get lost over time. And luckily, I think those films are classics. Black Swan will be remembered probably as his Best. ultimate, even though it's his, technically it just his more commercial film. It's yeah. definitely his more commercial film. Yeah, that's the thing. I, I think Black Swan's incredible, but mm. I, I, I really feel like, um, for me, Mother is his greatest film. Um, it just did <coughs> so much yeah. in terms of like... Uh, just making you think and giving you a conversation. It made you walk away from the film and feel like you could only talk about the film until you'd resolved what yeah. this puzzle I was. Can, I can vouch for that because Jack's told me about the film about six times. <laughs> 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 oh, have you seen Mother? <laughs> See, for no, me, Jack. <laughs> it, it's always going to be reckoned for a dream. And like, a lot of it is because I used to take a lot of drugs and know what that kind of stuff's like and I used to watch Wreck of a Dream a lot whilst on drugs and be like uh, it could be worse <laughs> uh, but it's just it's such a vivid film like every shot's just perfect the performances it's I love a downward spiral and, and to me that's like one of my top 10 favourite films what about you do you have an Arnavoski favourite um 
I, I'd probably say either The Wrestler or Black Swan. I love The Fountain. Like, mm. I think I first saw The Fountain. I went through a phase um, whenever I first moved to England in 2009 where I just bought a load of DVDs and The Fountain was one of them. And I watched that and it really tripped my balls. <laughs> and I was just like, what the fuck is this? But then when you start to reflect on it, yeah, you start yeah. to understand exactly what it's about and, you know, the tree of life and stuff. It's really cool. Um the wrestler really impacted. I thought that was cool. I'm a massive wrestling fan as well, so that was kind of like nice. But I remember going and seeing Black Swan in the cinema, and I came out tripping balls. Like <laughs> fucking hell, that is that is something else. Like just the psychology, the 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 emotional turmoil that someone will put themselves through to try and gain that ultimate kind of goal of perfection for their art, like. Yeah. And being an artist as well, like creating films or doing theatre or stuff like that, yeah. like it really sort of hit home. It's like, would you push yourself to that that extreme? Mm. See, in that respect, like Black Swan could be seen as his best film simply in that like dynamicness of what he does. That like, everything's firing all cylinders. You know, you've got perfect performance, perfect score, perfect cinematography, perfect structure for what is a horror film. But it's only a little bit later on when we go, right, let's go full on horror and just fucking mess with them as much as possible. Whereas sometimes if he's, he, he can be very, very indulgent with a lot of things that don't always hit on some of the smaller elements within it. But I, I, I can see why Black Swan will be considered his masterpiece in the end. But personally, it's... Yeah, it's you take weird. the commercial side out of it. I think in, the, in as much as a psychological like, um, trip... Black Swan is right up there. Well, the way I think the way that he sort of in in Black Swan particularly like blends that that magic realism with um, with like psychosis almost, yeah, yeah. so that you're quite you're never quite sure whether this is something that she's really experiencing or whether it's something it's that is in her head. And uh, I I can't think of a, a better example of that in, in uh, like <laughs> other than Aronofsky's work generally. I think that there's quite a few times that he does that in Requiem for a Dream. Um, he does it a bit in Noah as well like that idea that um, uh, although it seems to be almost like deliberately lacking in Noah like when Noah's talking to God and there's yeah, no yeah. answer uh, but he hears it and, and you know it almost uh, plays more on that psychosis well, element it's, it's kind of like the thing is it's very similar to Polanski stuff like when in you know like Repulsion and The Tenet and stuff like that but rather than claustrophobia in that inner creepiness it's more operatic so he knows how to give you that, that claustrophobia feeling or that feeling that something's impending, again, going to Requiem, the fridge scene. Mm -hmm. But it's so big in scale and it has to go a bit more absurd that you want to scream and run away from it. And I think he just does that so well that he can bring you to a point where you're like, all right, that's a bit weird. And you're just like, oh. And it's like the paintings. When they start screaming in Black Swan, you're not ready for it. Yeah, and yeah, it catches yeah. you and she's running into the moment towards it as well. And it's just, it's, he's very good at orchestrating stuff like that. Thank you guys for listening to this week's podcast. As ever, please leave a like, subscribe, and um, leave a comment with your favourite Darren Aronofsky film. Um, as ever, guys, check out our uh, website. We've just put up some new content and stuff. We've got new films that are being released now, so that's www.trasharts.co.uk. And other than that, Trash Arts take out. Bye. Ta -da.